Welcome to the Young Entrepreneur's Journey with your host, Yasmina Ellens. Welcome to the Young Entrepreneur's Journey, where we take the skills, mindset, and attitude needed to achieve any entrepreneurial endeavor, whether you're just starting out or you're already on your journey. And now, our host, Yasmina Ellens. Hello and welcome back to the Young Entrepreneur's Journey podcast with your host Yasmina Ellens. Now today I've got a really special treat for you because we all know the power of mentors. A mentor can shortcut your learning curve and fast track the path you're on to success. And all of the greats had mentors. Bill Gates, Alexander the Great, Warren Buffett, Tony Robbins, the founders of Google, Mark Zuckerberg, Cody Bryant, like I could go on forever. The list is endless. And it really only does take one person to completely change your life. And that was the case for our guest today, Mark Tim, whose life was changed when he met his mentor, Kevin Harrington, with whom he wrote the book, Mentor to Millions. Now, Mark is a serial entrepreneur who started a retail gift company out of his garage and grew it to become a multi-million dollar enterprise and the number one supplier of its kind in North America, and has, of course, done many, many other incredible things since. His mentor, Kevin Harrington, was one of the original sharks on the hit TV show Shark Tank the inventor of the infomercial and has scaled over 20 businesses to over a hundred million in dollars in sales. Now, Mark spent years working side by side with Kevin and has filled his book, Mental to Millions, with a goldmine of practical lessons that he learned from his time spent with Kevin. And I'm, I'm saying this very honestly. This is honestly one of the best business books I've ever read. And I highly recommend it to anyone who can get one to, to, to just get it because it's really good. Uh, but by the end of the interview, you will get a clear understanding of how the right mentor can change your life. You will have the roadmap to building a powerful relationship with your mentor, and you will feel that you too can get the guidance you need to propel you forward on your path to success. So thank you so much for joining me today, Mark. I'm really well, excited for this interview. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here as well. I mean, uh, we were we were talking off camera, and I know uh, just the name of your podcast, and I, I'm thinking back and going, man, if I could rewind time and I could go back a couple decades, what would I do differently in my life? And I can tell you, I would put more mentors in my life. There's no question about mm-hmm. it because you said it in your inter- introduction. They they shortcut the learning. They help you learn from your failures. I mean, it's just it's on and on on what a mentor could do for you. But here's something you may not know. If you were to Google this statistic, you'd find that less than half of the people out there in business have a mentor, less than half. So wow. you kind of divide the world into the haves and the have nots. And we, we've heard that before, but that's one of the reasons we wrote this book because we want to make sure that everybody crosses over into the haves because we know if you've got a product, a purpose or a passion that the world needs, the fastest and the biggest way to get it to the world is mentorship. Mm, I completely agree. Mentors have had a huge difference in my life and it's due to mentors and the right peers around me that the the path that I was personally on, the journey that I'm on, has just completely accelerated beyond what I thought was possible a year ago. Um, Which brings me to my first question I always like to ask my guests in this podcast, just to backtrack a bit. So Mark, what originally got you onto your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, so uh, I wasn't an entrepreneur right out of uh, school. In fact, I grew up on a farm. So I like to say I'm a farm boy from Fillmore, Indiana. And I, I went to college. I worked for some big companies, uh, Kellogg's. I, I worked for USA Today. Uh, and so that was my early you know, kind of professional career. But I just knew, I knew instinctively that I was supposed to do something else. And I, I'm thankful for those early experiences, but it really was when I started my family. I got married, I started a family, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I want to be more for them. I want to have more control of my schedule. I want to do some things. I want to be the kind of, of father that I was put on this earth to be. And I found it very difficult with having other people dictate my work world. And so I literally became an entrepreneur out of necessity to be the, the kind of human being and, and the father and husband I was put on this earth to be. And that began my journey. Now, as it turns out, I think I was always supposed to be an entrepreneur. And I was having a conversation over the weekend. There's a couple different kinds of entrepreneurs. There are people that have original ideas and they, they bring that idea to the world. 
And then there are people like me that uh, surround themselves with people that have original ideas. And then I make those ideas a reality. And I can take an idea that will never be seen by the world and I can show it to the world by using my sales marketing you know, expertise. And so, uh, so I have found that uh, when I surround myself with really creative people, amazing things happen. Uh, some of the people in my life say my middle name is Make It Happen Mark. And so, you know, so that's what I do is I make things happen and I make ideas uh, happen to, for the world. So that was the beginning, kind of my origin story of being an entrepreneur. Now, I will tell you, the thing I love most about being an entrepreneur is actually selling my businesses. So uh, one of the reasons I'm a serial entrepreneur is because I've sold seven of my businesses. I, in fact, sold my businesses and then seven years later, bought it back from the people who bought it from me. And then two years after that, I sold it again. And to me as an entrepreneur, there's nothing cooler than building something of value that someone else is willing to pay you for it. So that's one of the reasons now when I start a business, I'm thinking about how I exit, how I sell it before I even start it. Mm. That's really interesting. And I've definitely felt the same in, in terms of, you know, there, there are so many people out there. We all have ideas. And I know that Sarah Blakely likes to say everyone in the world has had a billion dollar idea, but it's the entrepreneurs who actually make the idea happen, who actually put it into action, who reap the rewards. Um, and so what I'm curious to know is, you know, you already had this great raw material and this, this excitement to, to do things and make ideas happen. So bringing this to the topic of mentorship, I'm wondering, how did you meet Kevin Harrington, start to form that relationship with him? And how did mentorship with him bring your entrepreneurship projects to the next level? Yeah, it's so cool because the book is called Mentor to Millions. Now, I want to make sure everybody understands millions is not millions of dollars. Millions is millions of people impacted. And so that is actually what this book is all about. It's about the impact that you can have on the world if you have entrepreneurs in your life. And so, you know, when it came to this whole concept of meeting Kevin Harrington, I didn't know Kevin Harrington. Kevin Harrington didn't know me. I was watching him on Shark Tank. I'm, I'm sitting in my living room with my daughter watching Kevin Harrington. But here's the cool part. The cool part is that my, my first mentor in my life was a man named Zig Ziglar. And so Zig Ziglar mentored me and gave me just a wealth of knowledge. Guess whose mentor was also Zig Ziglar? Kevin Harrington. So Kevin had Zig as a mentor when he was a young man. I had Zig as a mentor when I was a young man. And so we were connected to the family. So it was actually the children of our mutual mentor that introduced Kevin and I to each other. And so we instantly had a no like trust relationship because of that connection. And in fact, the foreword to our book is written by the man who introduced us, Tom Ziegler, the son of Zig Ziegler. And so here I am, I'm meeting an original shark and I have to give him a pitch because, you know, he's crazy busy. He's probably the busiest guy I've ever met in my life. And I wanted him as a mentor because he had scaled over 20 businesses to a hundred million. I've had some good businesses, but I've never been able to scale to that level at all. So I wanted him as a mentor to help me scale. That was what I thought initially. So I went to him and said, Kevin, look, we like each other. We've gotten to know each other through, you know, Zig's children. But here's the deal. I need you as a mentor. You are crazy busy. So I am going to make this super easy for you. I will always value your time. I'll make it easy. And here's the catch. I will be your best student. I know you've mentored lots of people in your life, but I will be your best student. And that was the pitch that got him to say, yes, because nobody had ever said that to Kevin, I'll be your best student. And that's one of the keys. If you're going to go for it, if you're going to swing for the fences, if you're going to ask somebody to mentor you, you had better be prepared and committed to be their best student. And so, you know, so that was how I got Kevin as a mentor. And obviously, there's all kinds of great experiences in the book uh, of us traveling together and me learning from him. You know, I, I've coined this phrase, contagious proximity. A lot of times, mentorship happens in contagious proximity where it's caught, not taught. So it's not like Kevin sat down all the time and was like teaching me. 
I had to be in his proximity. And I learned a lot of the lessons from him, from his stories, from the way he does business. And I unpack all of that, obviously, in the book. Mm, Definitely. I think you raised some really interesting, some very important points. And I think when you tell someone, I will be your best student, and you just don't tell, you don't just tell them, you also back your, back your words with actions, because your actions speak so loud that I can't hear what you're saying. But uh, I think it's so true. I've I had several mentors and I've also mentored and coached several people. And you know, as as someone who's helping someone out and trying to help someone accomplish a goal that I've already achieved, one of the most frustrating things that I've ever experienced is when you say, hey, just do this, this and this. Believe me, trust me. I've tread this path. And they're like, oh, no, I don't think so. Or they're like, no, but I tried, uh, but I... They just make up all these excuses and you're like, why am I even here? You know, but when, when on, on the flip side, when I've helped people and they've done exactly what I said and I see all the amazing things that have happened because of that, I get this amazing fuzzy feeling and I'm like, wow, this person is doing what I, I'm, I'm telling them to do. I'm going to keep doing it. So I think it's a, a really important point, which brings me to a question. Um, how can you be an excellent mentee? Uh, aside from that, or maybe including like what makes a really good mentee? What makes you really attractive to a mentor? Yeah. So, uh, well, first and foremost, we covered the most important thing, which is to be their best student. And and by by doing that, what does that look like? What that looks like is, is that you act now, like you implement, like you don't wait until the next meeting to say, oh, I'm getting started. You take it and you put it to action, even if you're unsure of it but you actually do it and then you follow back up with them. And one of the things that I would also say makes a good mentee is be willing to fail. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, I think Brene Brown uh, once said, you learn more in 10 minutes of agony than 10 years of bliss. And so be willing to fail, be willing to, to implement and, and know that you may not even have the experience yet to do it, but you're going to try it. You're going to get out there and, and be vulnerable you know, with this information that your mentor is giving you, because here's the deal. The mentor will help you learn from that failure. That's the cool part. Like, you know, it's it's failure is not final. In fact, we have a we have a chapter in the book. It's called Failure to Phoenix. Now, a phoenix is a mythical bird that only gets stronger if the previous version of itself dies. So in the entrepreneurial world, that's failure. And so one of the things you mentioned some pretty amazing people at the beginning of this interview. And one of the things that I found was interesting was when Kevin was in a room, he was often seen as the most successful guy in the room. However, he would once once said to a room of 500 people that uh, he said, here's something you don't know about me. I have failed more than anybody in this room. That's one of the reasons why I've been so successful is because I've learned from my failures. I've been not afraid to fail. And every time I failed, I learned and I got stronger as a result of that failure. And so many times we're afraid to fail. So a good mentee is not afraid to fail because that's where the learning takes place. And you can go back and say, I tried exactly what you said and it didn't work. And then the mentor can smile a little bit and say, ah, you know, you tried exactly what I said, but you did it in your own way. And this is what happened. And this is why it happened. Now try it again in this way or with this group of people or in this fashion. And then you go back. But if you don't try it, you don't have that learning. Okay. And then the last piece. Okay. So first piece, be the best student. Second is you've got to, you know, literally put in action, implement, do the things, not be afraid to fail. But here's the third thing. And this is, this is the real secret sauce that I'm giving you here. And that is in order to be an excellent mentee, you have to take what you've learned and teach it to someone else. Because if you don't, it's just a collection of wisdom. You know, it's like these bricks behind me, okay? All right, these bricks, like the mentor gives you the bricks and your job is to collect the bricks. But the bricks, you can knock over a, a pile of bricks. It, it's They're worthless. But it's that concrete inside, the mortar that holds them together, that makes it strong. If you will teach someone else, that's the concrete. That's what locks those bricks in. That's what creates a foundation that you can build a business on. You can build a family on. You can build relationships on. And so that's really the three-step formula for any mentee. Be the best student. Act on that advice. Don't be afraid to fail. And then teach other people. And you will absolutely be on your way to exponentially impacting millions. Mm. 
you you raised some it's a really great formula raised some really good points and it, it goes back to when i'm thinking of you know my my own professors in in cambridge and imperial they're like the top of their fields in academia and why are they the best because they spend their entire life teaching their subject like to become the best uh the, the best arbiter of a subject to best understand anything the best way to learn it is to teach it and I also think that your your analogy to failure is really powerful and it makes me think of when a kid's at school and you know you're sent to do homework your your teacher or your quote mentor tells you to do, go home do the homework and the kid who goes to the back of the answer book and copies all the answers doesn't learn anything but it's the kid who's willing to fail and be like okay I'm an idiot I made 10 mistakes on my maths homework but then understands this is why I went wrong and then they can course correct and then they get uh, like a really high mark on the exam at the end of the year because they went through that process. So I think that's a, a really powerful um, formula that you gave. And that brings me to the question then, what makes a good mentor? Yeah, <clears throat> this is an important question because oftentimes we, we look for a mentor and all we see is, oh, this person's super successful. I want them to be a mentor. And what you don't see is, is that you really need a mentor that has also failed. Like you don't want a mentor that just the first idea they ever had was successful and they became rich and famous because they only know one way of doing things and they only know one track to follow. And so you want a mentor that you can look up on Google and see if someone's been successful, but you often can't find if they've been a failure. And so you want someone that's experienced a lot in life that has a lot of wisdom for you. The other thing that you want is, you know, uh, God gave us two ears and one mouth. And you want a mentor that listens because you've got a uniqueness. I, I agree with Sarah Blakely. Everybody's had a billion dollar idea. And so you want a mentor that's going to listen and say, what is your unique ability? What is your genius that you have to offer the world? And if they're not willing to listen, if they're just like, oh, OK, I'll be your mentor. Do this, this and this, because I tell everybody to do that or everybody needs to do this. Well, you're not everybody. You're special. You're unique. You've got a gift for the world. And so you need a mentor that's willing to figure out what that gift is. And so, and, and by the way, not only do you need a mentor that's failed so that they've got experience, but here's one of the best traits of any mentor. They let you fail. Like do not get, one of my biggest complaints of parenting in, in this new era is parents don't let their children fail where they're robbing them of the learning. They're robbing them of the growth that they need to be able to tackle the world. So the same thing in a mentor, you want a mentor that's going to let you fail because that's where the learning takes place. That's where they can best help you is to learn from your failure and accelerate your success. And so, you know, so I, I know I'm like throwing a lot out there, you know, but these are important things. Oftentimes people will go, oh, if I just had this person as a mentor, my life would change. Well, you know what? You can have someone that's a whole lot less famous and maybe a lot less, quote, publicly successful, and they could help you 10 times as much as somebody that is just going to say there's one way to succeed in life, and that may not be your way. So find a mentor that's had a vast amount of, of experience, success and failures. Find a mentor that really will listen to you, that will let you fail, and, and find a mentor that, uh, you know, that you, here's, here's the equation, okay? I, I like steps. You need to know this person, okay? So you need to get to know them. And then once you know them, you need to decide if you like them because it's really hard to learn, you know, from a mentor that you, that you don't like. And so you may find that your personalities just clash. So you have to get to know them, then decide if you like them. And then third, and this is so important, is do you trust them? Because in order to act on and do what they tell you to do, there's got to be some trust there. So I call it the no like and trust formula. And if you can check off all three of those boxes, then likely, you know, you've got a good mentor. Mm, definitely. Some really, really good points. I, I completely agree. If they're not willing to let you fail, it, I, I, the parenting analogy was such a good one. And I'm very excited to touch on a bit later in this interview about the idea of family, because the way you talk about your own experience with your family and tie that all into mentorship and business is, is really unique and really interesting. Um, just to continue down the thread of mentorship a little longer. So people are thinking, OK, I know I know how to be a good mentee. I know how to be a good mentor. Um, how can I find a mentor? Ooh. Where do I find these people? 
What what advice? Wow, that is like the isn't that the million dollar question, right? Mm. Okay, and so where do I find mentors? This I'm going to I'm going to make this. I'm just going to destroy every everything you've ever thought of, you know, about the idea of this by saying, I believe. Okay, if you're listening to this, I'm I'm going to say this very carefully because this is really powerful. I believe you already know everybody you need to know to accomplish everything you've been put on this earth to accomplish. The question is, are you ready to be vulnerable? Are you ready to be courageous? Because what it really takes to find a mentor, you've maybe heard this saying before, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And so oftentimes we think that finding the right mentor is an external activity. When I believe that finding the right mentor is an internal realization of you staying, looking in the mirror and saying, I'm ready, raising your hand and saying, I'm ready to learn. I'm ready to be coached. I'm ready to change. I'm ready to act on wisdom. Notice I never once said, I need, I want. It's about being ready. If you're ready, then you will find a mentor. Now, the practical steps of that, if you don't trust me on this, then I'll give you an, a, a, a something to act on. Okay, so almost everybody listening has social media. Maybe you have a Facebook or an Instagram or a LinkedIn or whatever your, whatever your choice is. Tonight, if you simply will post on a couple of your social media channels, maybe you're wanting to start a business. So you say, hey, my name is Mark. And I'm trying to start a business. I'm looking for mentors to help me. Can you introduce me to one? That's like 12 words, okay? 12 words. If you post that tonight, I guarantee you, you will have more than one person, maybe even a dozen people raise their hand and say, I can help you. Or if I can't help you, I know exactly who can help you. And you'll go from having no mentors to interviewing mentors just by one courageous, vulnerable act of putting yourself out there and saying, I'm ready. I need help. And so to me, that is the hardest part is, are you ready? And if you're ready, I believe that the right person is in your life or the right person is in your life to introduce you to the person that's going to help you next. Mm. Definitely. It's really powerful and it's so true. It really does take that that leap of faith and the willingness to put yourself out there because for many people, putting themselves out there saying, hey, I need help or I would like help. You know, I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to be humbled. That's a really scary thing because our ego uh, likes to likes to protect us and it gets in the way of a lot of things. It gets in the way of your growth and your failure, which leads to success. And so I think yeah, just taking that one step um, will prove to yourself that, yes, I am ready and this is possible. So I, I've done several uh, podcasts and, and interviews, and this has happened now on four different occasions where the person interviewing me has an audience that can, impacts hundreds of thousands of people. In, in, in two cases, it was over a million people. And at the end of the interview, they said, hey, would you stay on for a few minutes? You know, afterwards, they stopped the record button. And then they said, hey, I was really moved by what you had to say about mentors. And I realized I need a mentor in my life. Would you be my mentor? And I'm like going, oh, oh, why did you not say that on air? Why did we have to stop record? Because do you know how many people are listening to you? following you and thinking the same thing. You know, I want a mentor, you know, I I need a mentor, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be vulnerable enough to ask for it. And here this person is, you know, turning the record button off. And why? Because they were unwilling to be that vulnerable on air in front of their audience to say, I'm ready. I'm so ready that I'm going to just lay it all out there right now and be raw and vulnerable and ask for mentorship because even though I've achieved a level of success, I need mentorship in my life. And I think you're the guy that can help me. Do you know how many people would have been impacted by that if that had happened on air? And so, so even people that seemingly have it all together and are successful, they suffer from not being willing to be raw and vulnerable 
And, and that means that they, they're just not truly ready. And so, you know, whereas I've agreed to mentor people that have come to me and just were raw and vulnerable versus people that literally have a million people following them, they're not ready. And so they're not ready. And, and if, if they're not ready, then they need to get ready before I can help them. So that's just an example of, you know, of just how much and how many people suffer from that, uh, you know, that lack of, of vulnerability or courage when it comes to getting a mentor. Mm, that is so interesting. That is extremely interesting. And I think, you know, there are so many, I, I think people who, who listen to podcasts and see what entrepreneurs are doing, um, they think, oh, this person has it all together and their life is perfect. And that's so far from the truth because, you know, you could be a billionaire and your life cannot be perfect. It's just this human nature. It's the, it's the way things are. And, um, you know, we, we can talk about this a bit later as regards what you did with your family as well, which I think is really cool. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a complete myth because we're all humans. We all experience uncertainty, fear, pain, doubt, all of us. That doesn't just go away. It stays with us because that is the nature of being a human. Um, what I'm cu really curious to hear from you, Mark, is um, so you've written an entire book filled with business lessons that yep. you've learned from your mentor, Kevin. And if people are yep. still here thinking, I don't know why I need a mentor, that's not clear to me yet. Um, I'm, there are so many powerful this, um, lessons in here. Like I was telling you beforehand, I've put corners everywhere. I've highlighted it. Um, and I'm sure there are many powerful lessons that haven't even made the book because there are probably so many. But I'm wondering what are some of the really key lessons yeah. in business yeah. that you've learned from Kevin? Mm -hmm. So one, I, I would say I'll, I'll pick two because I could, there's like 20 that I could, I could choose, but let me just pick two. Um, and one of them, the first of which has impacted me significantly. I mean, I'm on my way to my first $100 million business and it's because of this lesson. All right. And so, and the lesson is called aggressive curiosity. Another way to say it is where are the eyeballs? Okay. Where are people looking? So oftentimes people have a great business idea, but people aren't looking in that direction. So you can have a phenomenal business idea, but if nobody's looking in that direction, you're not going to be successful. But if everybody is looking in this direction and you've got a decent business idea, the chances of being su successful are a hundred times more than if nobody's looking at it. So for example, you know, during the pandemic, you know, if you had the best restaurant in the world, okay, the coolest concept ever, it wasn't going to be successful because nobody was going out to eat. Yet on the same token, if you were selling amazing food that people could order online, you just, your business was skyrocketing during that time because that's where all the eyeballs were at. So right now, a lot of people are shopping online. So if you're looking to start a business and you say, well, I want to start a business. Okay, well, where are people looking right now? Well, people are on their computers shopping. So the odds increase dramatically if your business has an online component that people can actually buy the product online. And then you say to yourself, well, that's pretty general. So let's get a little more specific. Okay, so what new habits have been created as a result of this pandemic and, and COVID? And you say, well, people don't want to go to the doctor as much because that's where sick people are, but they still have hurts and ailments. So maybe you want an online business that's helping people to take care of their bumps and bruises and the, their sniffles and, and at home. And so now all of a sudden you've got, okay, everybody's looking here, new habits are being formed and my business is satisfying that new habit. The chances of success are huge. Like, like you're almost guaranteed to be successful if you put it in that channel. So that's where aggressive curiosity comes from. It's about learning what habits are people forming that are going to stick? Where are people looking? So my new business is exactly what I just described. I set up an e-commerce business to help people at home with home health care so that they didn't have to go to the doctors. And all the products are helping them take care of their family and themselves without going to the doctor. Now, obviously, if they need to go to the doctor, fine, but I'm talking about bumps and bruises and cramps and, and sniffles and stuff like that. And there's plenty of products that help people at home to deal with those things. And that, that business is just skyrocketing. Okay. So then lesson number two is the dream team. See, one of the big mistakes that I made in my businesses was I always hired who I could afford. Think about that mm -hmm. for a second. 
Me and 99.9% of all entrepreneurs hire who we can afford. But that's not how you create a dream team. You see, Kevin taught me, he's like, I would rather have a CFO for 10 hours a week that could take me to $100 million than to have a CFO for 90 hours a week that couldn't take me beyond a million dollars. Yet I could afford the million dollar CFO. I couldn't afford the hundred million dollar CFO at full price, but at, at 10 hours a week, I could afford them. And so you've got to put a dream team and a dream team is what team is going to take you where you need to go, not take you where you've already been. And by hiring who you can afford is building a team in your rear view mirror. You're literally building a team based on the size and scale of the company you've already built. And so it's very difficult to scale beyond where you're at because you're simply putting people in place that are going to keep you there. And so, you know, we unpack it. There's a whole chapter about the dream team. And so, but I've implemented the dream team in this new venture and I've got the most extraordinary team around this venture. And they're all people that are going to take me to a hundred million dollars, not people that I could quote afford. And I'll throw one more in there. And uh, one of the one of my things that I learned, Kevin does a lot of deals and entrepreneurs often get involved in deals. And most people are always looking for the best deal. I got the best deal here. I, I, I got the best deal from this person. In fact, if we get a really good deal, we often brag about it to our friends. But Kevin's a little different. Every time he was negotiating a deal, he wasn't looking for the best deal. He was looking and spending arduous amounts of time into figuring out how the deal could be fair. And the reason why is because good deals are never scalable. Generous deals are never scalable. Anytime you get a good deal or you give a generous deal, as soon as it scales, it's over because the person can't sustain the good deal you got. Or if you were just trying to be nice and I'm trying to help you, as soon as your business takes off, I can't just do that you know, continuously, so it stops. That's why so many deals that entrepreneurs make don't scale and their businesses are limited. But a fair deal, a deal that's truly fair where both sides are winning is scalable to a million dollars, to $10 million, to $100 million, to a billion dollars because it's fair for both parties. So most entrepreneurs don't take the time to structure a fair deal. They simply are looking for the best deal. And that is not the way to scale a business or a relationship. Hmm. It's true. I think many people have this effect where they're always thinking about the short term. They're like, oh, this looks great now. What's the best thing that I can get now? But forget the long term of the relationship or the long term of the business venture. And being so short sighted in the long in the long term um, could damage relationships in that way. And you could lose a lot of money and lose out on a lot of opportunities. So really powerful. Um, really enjoyed your points about the dream team as well. Uh, I think just having the right people. And this is how I think about people in your life as well. You know, your dream team for your, your peer groups, um, your, your friends, your mentors uh, and and the teams to your business ventures. Like who are the best people? who can accelerate you or your business forward on a path to success. So some really, really powerful lessons there and uh, a lot more detail in the book, of course. Now, pivoting slightly, I would really love to talk about your family. And I think many entrepreneurs have this or people get into entrepreneurship and they're suddenly like, oh, I'm building my venture, I'm building my life, I'm, bu I'm building this business and it's so excited. And I'm sure like families and friends of entrepreneurs might be listening, thinking, oh man, yeah, I never get to see my my brother or my friend or my husband. They're always so busy. They're always on the grind. They're always hustling. They're, they're never here. And in the book, you talk about how you were getting to this point with your family where you were like, I, I'd rather be on my business right now than, than here with my family. And I think we, we've all had this um, as entrepreneurs. Uh, but then you, you've you made the decision uh, to lead your family like a business and to, to treat your family as seriously as you treat business. Would you like to talk, to talk a bit more about that transition and yeah. how that but, transpired? And, and is a little spoiler alert, um, that's actually how the book begins. The book actually starts with me at the end of my driveway not wanting to go home. And the reason for an entrepreneur to not want to go home is like, uh, I lost a lot of money. I, I'm going bankrupt. My business is a failure, all these kinds of things. But that day 
I didn't want to go home because I just had the best day in business I'd ever had. I, I closed one of the biggest deals I'd ever done, biggest sale I'd ever made. I made every decision with confidence and clarity. And I'm sitting at the end of my driveway, not going home because I didn't want the feeling, the euphoric feeling to end. I knew the second I went home and walked into my house, I would be hit with all kinds of chaos and confusion. And I was leaving a world of confidence and clarity. And it was that moment, I call it my driveway moment, that I knew I had everything in my life upside down, that I was supposed to feel the way I was at the end of that driveway at home. I was supposed to be winning at home, not just winning at work. I was not supposed to be coming up with excuses to do more business because I felt better about myself as an entrepreneur, as a man, than I was at home when it, it was hard. It's hard at home. I had six kids at home, three boys, three girls. And, you know, and it was hard. There's no, there's no playbook for how to do this. And so, but yet I knew that I was put on this earth to be a father and a husband, not just an entrepreneur. And that's when it hit me. What if? The most valuable business that I will ever own, ever operate, ever even become a part of was the one I was going home to, not the one I was going to. What if everything I did in business was practice so that I could perfect it at home? And that's when everything changed for me. And that's when I started saying, wait a minute. Okay, I know business really well, but I'm, I'm getting crushed at home. And so, you know, so what do I do? Well, I'm just going to make my family a business. And I legally incorporated my family. You can look it up. I, my family is incorporated to be Tim's LLC. And my youngest child got the same amount of shares in the company that I got. And we started having shareholder meetings on Sunday nights. And we, uh, we created a family logo. We had a mission statement and, you know, and we, we figured out why our family was put on earth and what was unique about our family. And we started operating it as a business. Now, why was this so critical for me? Because everything I was doing in business, I just said, if I'm good at business in this area, I'm going to bring that home. And so the vernacular was the same. We had shareholder meetings. We, we created a family logo and, and a mission statement so that we you know, our enterprise value as a family and what our reputation was in the community mattered. And so, you know, I, I would do disc personality profile testing for my teams. And so I'm like, wait a minute, my most valuable team is the one at home. So I literally brought it home and I gave my whole family the disc personality uh, profile test. And then each one of them had to present to the family their results. And what it did was it gave my family permission to be different. It wasn't just that the, the brothers and sisters were annoying to each other. It was they were different than each other. They were wired different. They were made different. And it gave such a frame of reference for us to come back to and talk about the uniqueness of everybody in the family and their unique skills and their unique talents. It's exactly what we do in business. You know, you don't take someone that's really good in finance and put them in, you know, sales. You know, you, you let them take care of the finances and you let someone that's really outgoing, you know, oftentimes do more of the sales and marketing. You don't stick them in a, a corner office with no view and say, look at numbers all day long. And so we do it in business, but we don't do it as families. And so I just got to the point where I'm like, I'm going to give my family my best and my first instead of my last and my least. And I'm here to tell you that everything has changed. Everything has changed. The relationship that I have with my family is beyond what I would have even allowed myself to say publicly seven years ago. Like it is that strong. I started traveling for three years. I never went on a trip without one of my kids with me because it's again, that contagious proximity, what they learn in Ubers and on planes and in hotel rooms and at business dinners and masterminds is so far beyond what I could teach them sitting at home. And so I just truly ran my family as the most valuable business. And here's the cool part. Everything changed in their life. Everything changed in my life. But I'm still driving the same vehicle I drove that day in my driveway. I still live in the same home. I still have the same family. The only thing that changed that day was me. The only thing that changed was between my ears. Oftentimes people say, well, I could do that if I lived somewhere else, or I could do that if I had a different business, or I could do that if I had a different family. I don't know. 
but it's always, I could do that if, or but, or what that day changed because I changed and it was contagious to my family. They bought in, they saw me going all in and they saw that I really meant it. And over time, their lives changed forever. Mm. It's such an incredible story. It's the first time I've ever heard of anything like that. And it's just so, it, what, what really touched me reading the book was the transition for your kids specifically. And I'd love to hear more about how making that decision to run your family like a business and bringing your kids on all your business trips and really being there as a mentor to your kids actually changed their lives and impacted their development and the things that they managed to achieve. So, uh, you know, the first child that really got to experience it greatly was my oldest, uh, Marcus. And he, uh, he actually traveled overseas at one point. Uh, he wanted to go learn Mandarin. So he's in China and he made a mistake messing around with some boys and he hurt his hand and uh, he hurt it to the point that he had to go to the hospital and ultimately it cut his trip short. And, you know, and so I go over there, he's deflated, he's embarrassed, you know, and he's just like, what do I do? I've already, you know, covered my schooling for the semester. I'm going to have two months and I'm just going to sit around. And I'm like, no, you're going to go with me. You're going to, I've got these masterminds. I've got these events coming up and you're just going to travel with me for the next three months. And the people he met, the things that happened traveling with me during that time frame, have forever changed the trajectory of his life. In fact, one of the speakers, okay, this goes, I get chills even thinking about this. One of the speakers at one of the masterminds was talking about investment properties and talking about how you could buy homes and then rent them, fix them up, et cetera. And he was so fascinated by that. And so he started saving his money and he started doing jobs for other people to save his money. And so my, my son is, he'll turn 23 in a couple of weeks and he's already bought his own home with cash, fixing it up to, fl to flip it and working on his second home as a rental property. And that's all because of going with me to that mastermind and listening to that speaker and then being so inspired and putting these things in place and working towards those goals over the last few years. And that would have never happened if I had not shifted and made my family the most valuable business. Now, let me tell you about my daughter. I'm sitting in Kevin Harrington's house and, uh, and I brought my daughter with me and she's sitting over like in the kitchen area. And all of a sudden I get an email from my daughter who's literally 20 feet from me. And I don't typically look at emails when I'm, I'm doing, you know, business with somebody, but I had to look at it because I'm like, my daughter just emailed me and she's sitting right there. So I open the email and it says, dear Mr. Tim, it has come to my attention that you are in need of a personal assistant. I happen to know somebody that I believe would be highly qualified for this position if you would consider an interview. And so I forwarded the email to my HR person and said, I would like to interview this person as my personal assistant. And so, so she scheduled an interview with uh, the HR department of my company. She got all dressed up. Her mom, you know, helped her, you know, prep and she looked like a million bucks and she interviewed and she made it through HR and she ended up with my vice president uh, who interviews everybody before they work for me. And then ultimately she sat in front of me in my office and gave an amazing interview with a resume. And I said, okay, here's the deal, Cassandra. I think you would make an extraordinary um, personal assistant. The problem is, is to do that job, you can't be in public school. Like I travel a lot. And so how would this even be possible? And she said, I figured you would say that. So I want you to know that I've already had a discussion with mom and we have agreed to enroll me in an online academy so that I can do my high school online and travel with you as your personal assistant. How could you say no to that? This young lady traveled with me over the course of a year, over 30 times, 30 times. She met some of the most insanely incredible people during that year. And she got so good at being my personal assistant. I could go into meetings and never take a note. And she would give me a bullet pointed everything follow up of what I needed to do. That year forever changed her life, her trajectory, her career ambition, and it changed our relationship. The relationship that we have now is phenomenal. And it happened that year. I wish I could say I could do these things at home, but at home, we all have our own routines. 
we, you know, she had her routine. I had my routine, but 30 times traveling with me and, and the conversations we'd have after speakers and masterminds and events and meetings, you just can't do that, you know, without being in that contagious proximity. And so it changed her life forever. And the last one I'll share was another daughter. And, uh, you know, she saw herself not as an entrepreneur. She was the one that's like, okay, I'm not going to be an entrepreneur. Well, she has a heart for service. And so even though she said I wasn't going to be an entrepreneur, well, she learned so much from the family business that when she decided she wanted to do a project where she would collect shoes and send them over to Africa. And this little project started as just a little project in her school. Before it was done, she had collection depots in every single school in our entire county. She collected over 1,500 pairs of shoes and then contacted Delta Airlines and got Delta to participate and help. And we actually delivered those shoes to five orphanages all over Nairobi, Kenya. Now, there's a girl who know she's not going to be an entrepreneur. In fact, she wants to be a doctor. But because of learning business in the family, she applied all of those entrepreneurial skills to help 500 children that would have never had a pair of shoes if it wasn't for her entrepreneurial efforts here. So we don't always have to go. That's why I said, if you're listening and you've got a product, a purpose, or a passion that the world needs, you need mentors to get it to the world. And I'm also going to say, if you're out there and you've started a family, you're thinking about a family, you have a family, there's no more important group for you to mentor than your family. And I'm so thankful because I made this shift, because I made this change, my children have chosen me to mentor them to be young adults, to be, they, they've all left the house except for one. My last one is a senior this year in high school. And so all of my other kids have left the house and they chose me to mentor them, to teach them how to be the, the colleague, the college student, the, the coworker you know, hopefully, you know, someday they're not married yet, but the, the husband or wife or the mom or dad. And so I get to mentor them for the rest of their life because of that decision I made in that driveway so many years ago. Hmm. That is incredible. It's like hearing something like that, it almost makes someone speechless. And is I, I can tell how proud you are of your kids. And you have every right to be because they've achieved really amazing things. And I think it just goes to show as a, a really powerful lesson for entrepreneurs globally that, yes, you, your business might be important, but you're neglecting your family, the people who are closest to you in your life, when you really just shift your focus and put your priority there. And then you see how their lives change. And as their lives change, your life changes and all of your lives change for the better. I, I love to think of this analogy of the birds of a feather no, that's, that's the wrong one. But so like, but a herd of birds, like a flock of birds, a herd of birds, a flock of cows. What, what am I even saying? Um, uh, a flock of birds, they fly together um, and they get to safety and they soar higher together than one bird would soar much lower alone. So I think that's just extremely powerful. And I, I love the way that you hit that home there, which brings me to my final question, which I also ask every guest on this podcast. And so, so that is, you know, some really powerful lessons throughout this conversation. Um, but what are the three key truths about the entrepreneurial journey that you would drop on a young entrepreneur today? Mm. Three key truths. Mm. I think it's important for everybody to know too, you drop this question uh, with no notice. So it's just got to be instinctual <laughs> and, uh, and gut. And so I think that uh, the, the one, uh, I'll start with truth number one. Truth number one is um, that uh, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. It is inevitable. There's no such thing as, you know, becoming an entrepreneur and not failing. Uh, my mutual mentor, Zig Ziglar, used to say, there's no elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. You have to take the stairs. Every entrepreneur has to take the stairs. It's just the way it works. And part of taking the stairs is you're going to fail. So the real key is, is that are you going to learn from that failure? Are you going to get up from every failure and be stronger than you were before you failed? And if the answer to that is yes, then you are you definitely, you've checked the box off on truth number one. Uh, truth number two is 
you don't have to have an original idea to be a crazy, amazing entrepreneur. Oftentimes people say, well, I don't have a good idea or I want to be an entrepreneur, but I just don't have this idea. No, some of the best, amazing entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs who make other people's ideas. They make other ideas even better. Or they take an original idea from someone else that will never make it to the world and they take it to the world. And so, you know, so that's the, one of the big misnomers is, is that I have to have this extraordinarily good idea. No, you don't. You can oftentimes make an, somebody else's idea even better or make somebody else's idea and bring it to the world. And so, you know, so that is an absolute truth. And that's where I've done with my life, by the way. I, I don't believe I have to ever have another original idea in my lifetime. There are so many smart people that have original ideas. I just need to surround myself with them and then make their ideas reality or improve on those ideas. And so that's the kind of entrepreneur I am. Truth number three, we were not put on this earth to be alone. We weren't designed to be alone. We are human beings that are supposed to be in community. We're supposed to be in relationships. So why in the world do entrepreneurs try to do it alone? I mean, it's like the, the one thing that I see over and over is entrepreneurs trying to do it, to be a solo entrepreneur or to try. They're so, they're so you know, afraid of, of putting their idea out there that they keep it to themselves. Or like we've been talking about for an hour here, they're afraid to ask for help. They're afraid to ask for a mentor. They're afraid to put people in their lives that could really help them. So I'm here to tell you, we were put on the start to be in community. We we're put in the start to be in relationships. And the same is true with entrepreneurs. And I've personally found entrepreneurs to be one of the most helpful groups that there, that there are because they know it's hard. They know it's hard to get an idea out there in the world. So they're willing to help if you're ready to be uh, a student, if you're ready to learn. And so, so those are my three truths uh, for any entrepreneur and wisdom I would give any young entrepreneur. That's, that's extremely powerful, Mark. Thank you so much. Which brings me to uh, what would you like to plug to my audience and where can people find you? Yeah. So uh, obviously Mentor to Millions is, uh, is the book. And again, it's not millions of dollars. It's millions of people impacted. But I can tell you, you start impacting millions of people, you'll never have to worry about money again in your life. So Mentor to Millions. You can find the book on wherever books are sold. You can find this book. And if you want to connect with me specifically, you can go to marktim.com, T-I-M-M.com. You'll learn a lot more about my family. I like to talk about my family because here's the deal. When I started winning at home, it's so interesting that I started winning even bigger at work. And I thought it was going to be the opposite. The more time I spent helping my family win, my businesses would lose. But in reality, you get so much energy and you get so much joy. And my kids wanted to be a part. I'm convinced my kids couldn't even spell the word entrepreneur when I started down this path. And then they wanted to be a part of everything that I was doing. And so marktim.com, I share a lot more about my family and the idea of your family being your most valuable business. Extremely powerful, Mark. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm gonna I'm gonna do one more thing. Um, we cool. did this for people that pre-bought the book, and uh, if you'll go to Kevin Mentor, so Kevin Harrington, go to Kevin Mentor, one word, and if you buy the book, Kindle, regular book, doesn't matter. And if you go to KevinMentor.com and you show us you bought the book, we've got a 30-day mentorship for free, and we gave this away back for people who pre-bought the book. But for your audience. I want to give you the tools that you need to be um, successful. Maybe it's the first time you'll have a mentor. And it's basically Kevin and I giving mentorship lessons that we've learned from other mentors or that we've taught other people, both in business and family. So KevinMentor.com is another um, URL to, to write down. That is amazing, Mark. Thank you so much. I'm sure my audience will gain a huge amount of value out of that. So I'll put that in the show notes along with everything else mentioned in this podcast. And with that said, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. I enjoyed it as well. Take care.